Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge shall flow freely today, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Father God, I pray less of me and more of you, none of me and all of you. Think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords exactly the things that you'd have me to say to these, your sheep. I thank you, Father, that you've anointed them with ears to hear, hearts to receive, and a spirit to contain your word. It's in the holy, mighty, all-knowing, all-powerful name of Jesus, the anointed one, and the power of his anointing that I pray. And let all that agree shout amen. amen. Shout amen again. Amen. Give God another hand clap of praise. <laughs> Hug the person next to you. You may be seated. Yeah, I forgot to sow my seed. Uh-oh. Look at that. See? <laughs> God bless you. Whoever sowed it, I pray it back a hundredfold. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, we have a giving church, man. That's what I love about our church, man. We have a giving church. I guarantee you there wasn't 25 people here Wednesday night. Uh, just giving, loving, caring. That's what I love about this church, man. This church right here, man, I wouldn't trade it for nothing in the world. We have people that love God and love people. Uh, you know, that's why we don't have to do a bunch of that manipulative stuff some of these preachers have to do to, to get money. Amen? But you know what? We're givers. You got pastors that are givers. And as long as we continue to give as a church, the body will continue. Why? Because we're, we're a body. We all have parts. But with the head, the problem with, when you see your church not doing what it should be doing, ask yourself, what's up with the head? Amen? Amen? You know, if your household, your kids ain't acting the way they need to act, ask yourself, what's up with you? Amen. Well, Pastor, I did all I need to do. No, you didn't. Amen. They wouldn't be doing what they're doing. Amen. Say the fruit, the fruit is what matters. Wow. Yes, right. Jesus said, know them by what? The fruit they bear, not the talk they talk. Amen. Not how good they look, how good they drive, how good they live. Those are all good. But we need to know them by their fruit. Are they loving God? Amen? So we talked on Wednesday. We're talking about the four pillars um, that made up Jesus as a man of God. And today we're going to talk about discipline, self-control and discipline. So the first one was loving, loving. Uh, and we talked about love and how Christ loved. But how Christ didn't love the way man loved. Christ loved based on a standard. Based on Frank, you want to sit up here, man? I know Frank don't like being way back there on that last row. Come on up here, man. Amen. Get up here by the hot, by, by Tony up there, man. It's, it's hot up here where Frank likes it. Um, love. So he talked about love from a standards perspective. Jesus loved people, and he loved people unconditionally, but Jesus also had a, a, a standard. Even when he forgave the prostitute. You know, everybody talks about how loving God was, how loving Jesus was. Well, you know, preacher, Jesus forgave the prostitute. How many of y'all remember that? How many of y'all remember Jesus forgave the prostitute? Who was with the prostitute Jesus forgave? Say the preachers. Oh, y'all can say it. I ain't with no prostitute. Y'all can say it. I have a woman of God. Amen. And she's more than enough. Amen. Say Jesus was, say the prostitute. He was with the preachers. Because the preachers wouldn't have known, Teresa, what she was doing. If, right? How you know what's going on in the tent unless you're in the tent? Yeah. Hallelujah. But Jesus forgave the prostitute. How many people remember that? Everybody remembers that. Everybody. You, you can talk to a heathen on the street and they'll tell you Jesus, but Jesus forgave the prostitute. But you know what they never tell you? What did Jesus say after he forgave the prostitute? He forgave the prostitute and demonstrated love, didn't he? But right after the love came what? His standard. What did he say? Go and what? See, that's the part we don't want to do. See, see the church today, the grace church today, the grace, grace, grace church. God is grace. God is love. God's all those things, and God is a standard too. And Jesus lived, Jesus walked, and Jesus talked a standard. Jesus has a standard of the way we live. He carried a standard as a man of God. That was the first pillar in who Jesus was. You need to understand that. And I taught on it. If you didn't get it, go back and listen. Because it's very important that you understand these pillars. Why? 
Why do I need to understand these pillars if they were the pillars of Jesus' life? Because they need to be the pillars of your life. If you want to walk, if you want to live, if you want to, want, to, want to operate in exclusively Jesus, nothing more, nothing less, you're going to have to understand these standards. Amen? Amen. Number two, integrity. Integrity. Jesus operated in integrity, but not integrity like we think integrity. Integrity based only on God's word. Integrity, simply put, do what's right do it because it's right, and then do it right. Amen? If your next door neighbor comes over and slaps you, that's wrong, isn't it? But the right thing for you to do is not slap them back. You may want to slap them back. You may be justified in slapping them back. But integrity says we step back, we don't slap back. That's what it says. I, I didn't Listen, I didn't write the book, y'all. Don't everybody look at me like that. I didn't say I could step back if somebody slapped me. I'm just telling you. See, no, 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 y'all don't, no, no, don't laugh. Listen, because here's where we have the problem as Christians. See, you think you can't tell your grown adult children about how they're living because you don't live that way. But guess what? You can still speak the truth even if you ain't living it because the word is the word. Now, it might fall a little bit on deaf ears. And some of y'all don't speak the truth to your adult children because of the way you used to live. And that's not good because you don't live that way no more. And, you, and some of y'all can hold your head high and say, no, no, baby, I know what daddy used to do. But daddy don't do that no more. And you know daddy don't do that. I, yeah, but daddy, you did that when you was young. Yeah, and daddy was a young fool. I don't want you to be a young fool. I want you to be a mighty man of God. I want you to be a mighty woman of God. Amen? Integrity based only on the word of God. <clears throat> do what's right. Do it because it's right and then do it right. Matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 11, it says the integrity of the upright shall guide them. Shall guide them. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. Integrity can be your guide. What, is, what do you mean integrity being my guide? Just what I said. Do what's right. T Tony and Haiti when they was going through the thing. Man, it was at a point where they could have, all they needed was two papers that said something a little bit different than the paper they had. How many of y'all ever heard of uh, uh, Whiteout? <laughs> Come on, man. When me and Dean used to sell, listen, when Dean and I used to sell telecom, they used to pay us on the, we would get the phone bill. And then based on the phone bill minutes, you submit that times the long distance rate and that's how you got your commission. Man, I wore Whiteout out. Man, I want 10,000 minutes a month. No, let's make that 110,000 minutes. Matter of fact, let's add a comma and make it 1,100,000. Right, right, Dean? Was it? Okay. You remember Adelphia, right? We went to, they went to jail for that. Amen. Adelphia Communications. What are you saying? I'm saying that Tony and Haiti, in the midst of this great trial, they were faced with, they could have they just, smudged, just smudged one number. Say, do what's right, do it because it's right, and then do it right. I want you to hear that come up in your spirit every time you go to do something wrong. Every time you go to drink that drink, say, do what's right, do it because it's right, and then do it right. Every time you go to hit that blunt, do what's right, do it because it's right, then do it right. Every time you get ready to make a U-turn and look at that girl, go, go to get that girl's number. Do what's right. Do it because it's right. And then do, what's right. do it right. Let me tell y'all something, folks. This stuff works. It worked for me. Renewing my mind. Renewing my mind kept me from losing my marriage. I'm telling you, man. The enemy, let me tell you something. The enemy's not going to come at you the way you think he's going to come at you. He don't do that. He comes where you think you're good, where you think you're strong. That's why you got to have, you got to have, you got to have a, I call the word of God as my, my surrounding shield of protection. Because that word, man, when I'm doing things and when I'm operating, man, that word just bubbles up. That word bubbles up over here and it comes to my remembrance. You got to get in the word, right? So humility was number three. And when we talked about humility, we didn't mean humility as being weak. 
Uh, it seems that many religion, religious leaders at the time of Jesus were looking for something else. They expected the Messiah to come and hold uh, power. They, they expected him to be this great whatever. Jesus said, whoever is the servant amongst you is the greatest amongst you. So Jesus, Jesus washed his servants' feet. Jesus served his servants. Jesus served people. Title, position, those things were not important to Jesus. They were not at the top of his list. Fulfilling the will of the Father and doing what God called him to do was at the top of Jesus' list, amen? So those were the three. So today I want to get to um, the fourth pillar uh, that makes up the man of God that Jesus was, and that is um, self-discipline uh, or discipline, uh, self-control, uh, these things. And I want to talk today and I want to begin. I really want to spend maybe two or three days on this one or two or three services on this one. I'm not going to keep y'all here for two or three days. And y'all good with being here for two or three days? I could go two or three days. I'm telling you. But anyway, I want to talk about the 10 disciplines, the 10 disciplines that Jesus walked in. And I really want to take my time on this, okay? Um, because I think that we also have like the others, love, integrity, right, humility. I think we have a wrong thinking and a wrong understanding of discipline, okay? So let me talk about discipline. Success and failure in sports, as we look at it, is often determined by one's discipline in their training regimen, in their development of fundamentals, in their development of, of muscle memory, so that when their bodies get exhausted, they automatically know what to do. Why? Because they've disciplined their body. They've disciplined it, right? Uh, I know in boxing, man, I, I had disciplines where even if I was wooky or, or, or wobbly, I knew, you know, if a guy's, you know, right hand hits me here, I know that I could throw a certain punch because of his hand touching me, that's going to be open. I don't even have to see it, right? There are natural you see this with fighters that, that get, you know, almost where they're almost knocked out and they're seamlessly just fighting. And you're like, how are they even fighting? It's the discipline uh, that they, they instill. But I want to go over with you guys uh, some of the definitions, some of the synonyms, if you will, uh, of what discipline is. And then I want to go over some of the antonyms of what discipline is, because I think it's going to be very, very interesting. But discipline in, in the world sense, as we look at it, is constraint, constraint, um, um, discretion. Discipline is discretion. It's defined as discretion. In other words, knowing that, you know, if you eat that Twinkie, uh, is, it, you know, and you're trying to lose weight, you need to have discretion with that Twinkie because it's not going to help your cause, right? A lot of times it's not what we can do. It's not what we can do. But we don't understand it. Say, say, say this with me. Say, I'm grown. I'm grown. I can do anything I want. Amen. Say, the Bible says, the Bible says I can do anything I want. want. Y'all got to get a revelation of that. I'm not talking about what you can do. I'm not even talking about what God said. God said everything is permissible. You want to drink, drink. You want to smoke, smoke. You want to cheat on your wife, cheat. You, you can do anything you want to do. But understand there are consequences to everything you do. And let me just share this with you. You don't always see the consequences. You don't always see the consequences. You got to get a revelation of that. Because you got to remember when you're doing things that you know you ought not to do, what's happening is you are sowing a seed. When you're doing things you you not ought to do, you have to remember that you are sowing a seed. And remember what I said earlier today, there's seed time and, no, and, let's not forget the and. What is the and? The and is the period between when you sow and when you reap. Seed time, say it, and harvest time. So it don't always, the, 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 the consequences of your choices don't always show up. I had a man I used to work with when I worked at a former telecom company and I was a pastor and we were having a Bible study and we, we, we had this conversation about drinking. 
And uh, after, the, after the conversation, I guess he was condemned because he drank every weekend. Uh, he pulled me aside and he started to justify his drinking to me. And I said, Stephen, I said, you know, man, look, do, do, do what you want. I, I mean, I'm just reading the word, blah, blah. No, no, but I, I just need you to understand, Nick. He said, I don't, I don't have a drinking problem. I said, okay, man, you know, cool. He says, you know, I said, but you drink what? Every weekend from fi Friday at five o'clock to Sunday night when he goes to bed, they drink all weekend. That's what they do. That's what their family does. That's their family tradition. But he don't have a drinking problem. So I asked him, I said, well, just, well, then, if you really want to see if you have a problem, just stop. Well, I can stop if I want to. I can say, okay, so just stop. And then I got the, the, the Holy Spirit gave me wisdom. And I put it to him another way. I said, see, Stephen, the truth is you have your drinking under control. He really did. He, he was an outstanding worker, outstanding guy, great guy. Uh, and that's what he chose to do on the weekends. And listen, drinking and, and, and being abusive in anything, in other words, overdoing anything, anything that is consistent in your life outside the word, when you don't choose to make the word consistent, but you choose to make another thing consistent, that other thing will eventually destroy you. Doesn't matter what it is. It could be playing football. Let's not use, use drinking. You got, you know, you got, you know, it, it could be anything. But the point to Stephen was, I shared a story with him about my cousins. You know, I had a, a family, a part of my family, where exactly the same as Stephen, my Uncle Mickey. My Uncle Mickey and my Thea and Anna and that family drank every weekend. My Uncle Mickey worked for Slits Malt Liquor Brewery. And every weekend, he'd bring home 10, 15 cases of beer or however many it was. And from Friday at 5 o'clock till Sunday, they would drink the whole weekend. Just having fun, not drunks. I mean, they just drank. It was fun. It was a way of life for them. And my Uncle Mickey was a stellar worker. My Aunt Nana, they raised, they raised their kids. They had 10, 7 or 8, 10 kids. Do you know that every one of my cousins, so again, my Uncle Mickey was good, right? He ended up dying young because of the, the alcohol gave him real bad diabetes, and he died like at almost 50-something years old. Uh, but So his life was taken short. But every one of my cousins is an alcoholic. Every one of his kids are, and I'm not talking about alcoholics like he was where they could control themselves. I'm talking about alcoholics that DUIs, vehicular homicides. I'm talking about alcoholic alcoholics. Everything they do is around alcohol. So all I'm saying is, is alcohol an issue? No, but anything that you make a consistent thing, that's what discipline's about. Discipline doesn't know. Whatever you choose to be disciplined in, you're going to reap a harvest from it. You need to understand that. And what God is interested in, he's interested in us putting him first in all things. It goes back to what I said. You know, we could consistently uh, 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 watch football. You know, I'll tell you all a story about football real quick. I'll never forget. Y'all know I'm a Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan, right? So I'm in the parking lot one Sunday at the church. I'm a pastor in the church. And uh, Katie and Mike pull up, two people that I knew. It wasn't literally Katie and Mike. And they hand me some tickets. Pastor Nick, man, we got two tickets to the Bucks game today at 1 o'clock for you. 50-yard line. I mean, you know, Teresa, I was excited. I'm waiting for service to end, right? So service is getting ready to end. I'm a pastor in the church now. You know, service, Pastor Poe, you know, he normally goes a little long, talks too much sometimes, Right? And the service is going long, right? So I go tiptoeing out of the service because I want to get to the Bucks game. I get in my car, and man, here comes the deacons running out the door. Pastor Nick, Pastor Nick, Pastor Poe's in the church calling for you. Turn the car off. I go back in the church. Hey, Pastor, I was, I was, you know, you know I'm a lie right in the church, right? Hey, there was a couple came up, a mixed couple. That's why he called me and my wife. And he wanted us, they were having marital problems. He wanted us to minister to them. Do you know that we minister to that couple and to this day, they're still in the church. <laughs> to this day, now they're serving God. Could you imagine if I would have gotten my car and went to a Buccaneer football game? There's no telling where their little mixed kids, because mixed kids 
come up against different challenges than regular kids. And you got to know how to minister to these people because it is different, right? It's not special. It's not worse. You know, oh man, it's harder because I'm mixed. You, you just a wussy. You know, stop that. Everybody has challenges. So you need to be disciplined. So the word discipline means constraint. It means refrainment. See that? I wanted to go to the Bucks game. If I would have been disciplined of what I was called to do, I would have refrained from wanting to do that. It means self-command. Not self-control, self-command. It's a little bit different. Uh, it means self-restraint. What true godly discipline, the discipline Jesus walked in was, not always saying what he wanted to say. Well, I'm going to get into the antonyms because the antonyms are going to describe a lot. So let's look at some of them. Let's look at what Jesus isn't. I mean, what discipline, when you don't have discipline, what it causes. See, some of you think discipline is self-will, self-control. I'm going to get into that as well. But discipline, and when you don't have discipline, it will cause confusion. When you don't have discipline in your organization, it causes confusion. When you don't have discipline, it causes disorder. Disorder. It causes neglect. It causes uh, permissiveness. Lack of discipline will allow you to tolerate things you shouldn't tolerate. It'll, it'll, a, a, a person that lacks discipline will be defined as laid back. Oh, I'm okay, Pastor. I'm just laid back. I'm just easy going. No, you're undisciplined. You're undisciplined. Um, it'll cause you to be an undisciplined person. Listen to this for all my leaders. Will be undemanding. You're not demanding because you don't have discipline. You don't want to demand nothing of anybody because you don't want to be demanded of because you're not disciplined. You know they're going to call you out. You can't be demanding for somebody to be on time because you're always late. You're not disciplined to be on time. Um, undisciplinedness will cause you to be very candid. Now, we're teaching right now we got to be more candid, but there are some people that are too candid. They got to say whatever they want. You need to say what you need to say, but everything we say, we need, especially in, in church, needs to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Write this down. Discipline and self-control in Christ doesn't come from your willpower to do. Discipline and self-control in Christ doesn't come from your willpower to do. It comes from from the routine you choose daily. Let me say it again. Discipline and self-control does not come in Christ, does not come from your willpower to do. It comes from the routine you choose daily. Godly discipline isn't a daily struggle of willpower. It's a daily routine of surrender that brings you closer to Jesus and allows his power to flow through you. Hallelujah. Did you hear me? Let me say it again. Let me say it again. Godly discipline is not a daily struggle of willpower. That's what a lot of y'all do. You struggle every day not to do the things you know you should do. That's why you're in condemnation. That's why you always feel guilty. That's why you always feel like a failure. Because you're always struggling to do things. You ever notice it's always overweight people struggling not to eat. It's evident you can't do it. Stop trying to do it. You got to turn it over to God. So what does that mean? You got to change your daily routine. It's a daily routine of surrender. Surrendering to what? The word of God. Surrender that brings you closer to Jesus, and that allows his power to flow through you. It's you being close to Jesus. It's the word being in you that's going to allow you to overcome, not your willpower. So today I want to get into the 10 disciplines of Jesus. Man, this, man, if you ever don't get anything else and you get these next teachings and you make a decision to start to implement them in your life, my only goal in everything I did in ministry 
was never to, 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 was never to learn uh, how to be a, 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 a this or how to be a that. It was simply to learn to live my life and learn how to mimic Jesus. If you learn to mimic and to live your life after Christ, man, your life will be so much better. It'll be so, don't try to live your life after Warren Buffett. Why would you want to live your life after something that you can live your, if you can live your life after the creator, why would you want to live your life after the created? If you can live your life exclusively like the creator, why are you, why are you, why are you even measuring yourself up to the created? You know, before Warren Buffett did what he did, nobody did it. So that tells you he had to believe in something beyond. All these people y'all think are great. Who was the guy in the Olympics, the, the black guy that broke the record in front of Hitler? Je Jesse Owens? Yeah. Before Jesse Owens did what he did, nobody in the world, right, had ever did it, right? So who did he believe? Stop having to see everything. Operate in faith. Let's see. How did Jesus do that? Let's look. Because remember again now as we go through these. Remember, stop looking at Jesus as a God. He wasn't God. When we talk about him right here, he was you and me. This is his recipe to get the results he got. How many of y'all like to have the results Jesus got in your life? Amen. Think about it. There's a group of us in here, a hundred of us, online in here today, talking about who? A guy that was here 2,000 years ago. That's pretty good results. There are people all around the world talking about this guy that was here 2,000 years ago. How many of y'all know he did, he did a pretty good job? He's the master of multi-level marketing. Amen? He's the master of communication. He's the master of overcoming. He's the master of, de of defeating the enemy. Why are we trying to look everywhere else? Let's look at the master's plan. Let's look at the master's blueprint. Amen? Amen. Let me ask y'all a question. Raise your hand. Don't say it out. Just raise your hand. If I could tell you tomorrow, I'm going to give you, Teresa, any blueprint you want, and I'm going to lay you in the midst of any fast food restaurant you want to pick, any one, any fast food restaurant, I'm going to let you hit your wagon to. Raise your hand. Oh, raise y'all's hand. Who, who has one? Raise your hand. All right. Pick a fast. None of y'all want to own a fast food restaurant? You can own a fast food restaurant tomorrow, and you're going to get the blueprint of this particular fast food restaurant to hit your wagon to. Which one would you ch hit your wagon to, Teresa? Chick-fil-A. How about you, Mike? Chick-fil-A. How about you, Tony? Panda Express. Who? Panda Express. Okay. Coverts, Chipotle, Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A. Oh, Chick-fil-A. Why? <laughs> Who? International House of Pancakes. But 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 look, we had a lot of different ones: Chipotle, International House of Pancakes, Coverts. But what was the overwhelming pick? Why? It ain't got nothing to do. You think it has to do with their food? Y'all sound like the people that think McDonald's at one time was the greatest fast food restaurant because they had good hamburgers. Does anybody in here like a Big Mac? Oh, oh, you do? Some of y'all have singed, singed palates. I get it. I get it. I get it. Few, few of y'all, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to stop. See, Annie, not everybody. See? Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't mess with her because I like crystals, so maybe my palate's a little bad, too. What's my point? Chick-fil-A has a really disciplined blueprint. They have a way they do things very consistently. They've demonstrated over time that it's not only that they deliver decent food, right, but they deliver consistent, right? You never get a cold French fry. Never. 
You never get, they forgot the pickles. Never. Right? I want my milkshake a little thick. It never comes thin. Right? You're ne you know that if you're in a hurry, you're never going to be in the line for 15 minutes. Never. Jesus would come back before that happens. Right? COVID came. COVID came. Everywhere else you go, we don't have this dressing because of COVID. We don't have this lettuce because of COVID. We don't have that because of COVID. Did you ever hear Chick-fil-A say one time, we don't have the Tunisian barbecue sauce for your, for your what do they call it, chicken nuggets because of COVID? Did you ever hear the word COVID uttered at a Chick-fil-A? Never, never. Now, I'm not going to go into the God part. They're Christian, Christian. I'm not even going to go there. Forget that for a minute. I'm just going to tell you that they're disciplined in what they do. The day COVID came, the day they understood it, they went in, a, a group of the executives went into immediate action to go into a war room and devise a plan to continue to deliver their food in the same manner in which they always have. Why? Because they care. They care. The biggest Christian attribute Chick-fil-A has is they care. They care. That's, that's really what's made them all their money. They care about their customer. Amen? So let's look at the, the, the discipline, number one, of Jesus. The first discipline of Jesus was Jesus was disciplined about the company he kept. See, that's what's wrong with a lot of you. A lot of you today, you don't have a word problem. You have, a, you have a company problem. Because no matter how much word we pour in you, if there's a leak in the gas tank, you can sit there and fill that gas tank up all you want. But if everything you're putting in is constantly going out, how much gas will you have? Nothing. 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 You won't. So the first thing you got to do is stop the leak. How do you stop the leak? You got to be conscious of the people that you're around. The Bible says that we are to fellowship one with another. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 25. We're going to go into Word now. Y'all ready? I talked enough. Y'all got about 20 minutes of not having to go through your Bibles. You should love your Bible. You, you really should, man. You should love reading the Word. But, Pat, I get sleepy when I read the Word. Listen to it. Listen to it. Listen to it. Do you know I used to put the Bible on all night long? I used to let it play all night long in my house. Just read through the Bible. Yeah, you could do that. Passing that might bother my wife. Put on headphones. Oh, the word's still going in you. Oh, don't, don't trust me, the word's still going in you. The word's still going in you. The word's still going in you. The enemy was trying to attack me one time at 4 a.m. in the morning. A Christian song was on moving forward. And man, he said some words in the word and it woke me up in the spirit. I sat right up in the bed. Hey man, we had been at Revealing Truth for a while. Things weren't getting better. Say, weren't getting better. Man, we were still broke. We were still struggling. Hey man, house was being foreclosed on. Hey man, hallelujah. And man, the enemy comes into sleep, try to get you, tries to get you when you're tired. That's why you gotta, you gotta know that you know. You know, I told the enemy that night, I said, you know what, enemy? I said, I don't know much, but I know I'm where God called me to be. And I know I'm under who God called me to be under. And there's nothing y'all can do. You could take my house. I could be homeless. I'm not leaving where God called me to be. He did it to me twice in my life. Two times in my life, the enemy did that. I mean, came at me real hard. Ain't going to do it. Ain't going to do it. I'm not giving up. And you know how I overcame that night? By what I just told y'all. I just gave y'all something. Just gave you a nugget. Do what's right. Do it because it's right. Then do it right. That nugget alone, if you incorporate that in the, the decisions you're making, that alone will make your life better. That night, the Holy Spirit came to me and he said, you will not quit. Therefore, you cannot be defeated. When quitting no longer becomes an option, 
Victory is the only outcome. Y'all see it? But had I not been in the word, had I not been like Jesus around company, under a man of God, under a woman of God, under a covering that said, I will not quit. Therefore, I cannot. Cannot. Isn't that a great word? Cannot. This ain't a maybe. I cannot be defeated. See, but you let the devil, and then you start reasoning with him. Well, you know, pastor's got his. I don't have mine. You know, all, all the stuff you start to, to tell yourself in your, in, in your mind. Amen? So in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, look what it says. It's in writing. I want to read it uh, in the Amplified. It says, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some people, but admonishing, worrying, urging, and encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. You know, we got this thing now with streaming. I, I could just stream it. You ain't assembling streaming. Streaming is not for the folks that live in Orlando. Streaming is for the folks that are away. The folks that aren't here. Folks that are in Orlando need to be in church. Twice a week. Think about it. There's 168 hours in a week. 168. Church is six of those 168. That's less than 1%, ain't it here? Less than 1%. But it's amazing how we always have, something's always going on. It's always something. I'm not going to say that, Lord. That was my flesh. 1 Corinthians. I'm a, you know, I'm a really simple guy. I'm really simple. You tell me you want to be on the team. But you don't show up to practice. We practice twice a week, but you want to play on Sunday, but you don't want to come to practice. You tell me you care about the team. You're the one guy that we need on the team, but you don't show up to practice. Now, the coach ain't going to tell you he needs you. Why? Well, he's a real fool then. Hey, Amen. God ain't going to tell you he needs you. God ain't never going to do that. God won't. God will not make you get saved. God will let you go right to hell. You think he's going to tell you he needs you serving? That's why I won't tell you we need you serving. Never. But if you're on the team and don't think you should be at practice, maybe you need to ask yourself, are you really on the team? At least come to church. Get the word to be on God's team. Are you getting that word? Because if not, whatever team you're on, they're the ones that are going to resonate with you in the time of trouble. That's why the word don't resonate with you in the time of trouble. Because you're not at practice. Chris, could you go out and run the route on Friday night if you don't go to practice? Can't do it. You're a great football player, aren't you? But if you don't go to practice, right? Right? No matter how good you are, you can't know the route, right? Got nothing to do with talent. You can be the most talented kid on the team. That young man started for varsity as a freshman. You know he's talented, right? Amen. That's talent. Amen? Amen? I had an opportunity to play on varsity when I was a freshman, but not because I was a good football player, because I could kick the ball. <laughs> I was a good kicker. <laughs> in, in, my, in my day in high school, no freshman, right, Dean? No freshman played on varsity. None. It didn't happen. We didn't allow it. But it, my point is it doesn't matter how good you are. If you don't show up, the coach can't put you in the game. It's only in the Christian church that we want to do less than and be exalted more than. Only in the church. And we'll argue that point. In the church. Feel some kind of way. When God ain't speaking to you and you're not even around God. Jesus was able to do what he did because of the people he hung around. 
Watch what he says here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 12. Let me read this in the Amplified. He says for... He says, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. He says, for just as the body is a unity and yet has many parts. You see that? And all parts, though many, form from one body. So is it with Christ the Messiah, one anointing. We, we have to understand that we have to be around. Go read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's all the whole thing talks about, the giftings of God, the callings of God, the parts of God, the parts of the Bible, and us coming together. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Watch what this says. 1 Corinthians chapter 33. First Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 33, look what it says. It says, but do not be deceived. Evil, evil communications corrupt what? Good manners. Do you see that? Watch what it says here in the Amplified. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. He says, do not be so deceived and misled. Evil command companionships. Do you see that? Evil companionships, evil communion, evil associations corrupt and deprive good manners and morals and character. But pastor, if Jesus came back, he'd be hanging out in the bar. No, he wouldn't. He'd be ministering in the bar. He wouldn't be hanging out in the bar. He wouldn't be making friends in the bar. He wouldn't be debating and having philosophical conversations in the bar. Well, you know, maybe, yeah, well, I know you kind of like men. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe God kind of missed it a little bit. Maybe, maybe you should like men. No, 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 no. That's not the conversation Jesus is going to have. Jesus is going to explain to him how God created man and how God created woman. Now, the fact that you're having a, a struggle with your sexuality and your lust is the same as me having a struggle with my weight issue. Jesus didn't create me to be 250, 250 pounds. Give God some praise. Woo! That don't sound like a good thing. Y'all see me coming down, right? Y'all see pastor. Huh? Woo! Huh? Oh, yeah. I went into Neiman Marcus yesterday and I put on that. You know, I told you all about that Armani suit. I put that Armani suit on Frank and I went, it's getting there, baby. It's getting there. That's my goal, to be able to walk into a store and buy a suit off the rack. Just a regular suit. Not a, I don't have to go to the big man, Anne Marie. I don't have to go to the big, I don't want to be the big man no more. I want to be the normal man just for once in my life. Amen. I don't have to go get a special shirt. I can I can just look at the shirt. 18 neck, 35 sleep. Praise Jesus. You know, not 18, 35, large fit for my big belly, right? What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this issue I got is no different, but we want to treat it different. Why? Because we've allowed the world to convince us there's that, that it is acceptable. It's not acceptable. This is not acceptable. This is going to cause problems. It's going to cause issues. Wrong choices do. So what is Jesus saying? We got to be around. He says here, let me read it again. You know, Pastor, I know she's that, but, but you know, I know she snorts coke and, and hangs out in the club, but I'm trying to convert her. You mean while she's snorting in your house? Smoking in your car? Huh? You ain't converting nobody. I'm going to let Tony tell you all testimony one day. About, about somebody he was with, and praise God. Same testimony as I had, the almost same one. You got to watch out who you hang out with, man. I tell people, when I made this decision many, 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 many years ago, I had to decouple from all of that. I couldn't go back there. Amen? Why? 
You can't go back to the people you're called to lead until you're ready to lead them. And if you could still be led, you don't need to be around them. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all get around the water for 10 minutes, your lips get all dry. Yeah. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Boy, that water looks real good. You know. Y'all know I'm not lying. You know, y'all go to the club. Then, you know, y'all are in the club. I'm just at the club. Then you start thinking about one of them hot nights you had after the club. And then, you, then you know, the next morning you're waking up and it was just another hot night. Right? Oh, I'm not lying. Y'all look at me like a fool all you want. I've been to all those places. You got to watch what you hang around. You got to watch the people. Jesus said it. You got to watch the people you talk to. Watch the people you associate with. What did, what, what's the world he's saying for? You lay down with dogs, you what? Wake up with fleas. Except if it's pencil. Right? Pencil don't have fleas, right, Mike? <laughs> Mike's got the best hound in the world, man. So he says here in 1 Corinthians, do not be deceived. So Jesus is telling us, don't be deceived. Your closest friends need to, pe your, your inner circle needs to be people that are word people, word of faith people. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses four, uh, uh, four, chapter 6, verses 14 to 17. I'm sorry. Amen? So number one, and, and we're going to dig into these more on Wednesday, but number one, the company you keep. The number one thing Jesus paid mind to were the people that he was around. Even in his disciples. You don't see Jesus around all the disciples. I don't know if y'all ever realize that. He was around three. Even within that hierarchy, he protected himself. He ministered to three, the three ministered to the rest, the whole nine yards. He ministered to everybody, but he was closest to, to three. Amen? Number two, and I think this is one of the most important ones, but you got to learn it both ways. The discipline, Jesus had the discipline of forgiveness and loving the unlovable. Jesus had the discipline of forgiveness and loving the unlovable. Go to Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Y'all get anything out of the word today? Amen. All right, man. We're going to get this. I'm telling you, man, if you just learn these, you take these 10 principles of Jesus and you make them as real to you as the 10 commandments, write them down. I promise you, you make these part of your monthly reading, your life will get better. Your life will get better because you'll read one every month and you'll, you'll make an adjustment. That's another thing y'all need to understand. Don't go home after these and start beating each other up. Did you hear Pastor Nick? You need to lose some weight. You ain't eating today. Matter of fact, you ain't eating for the next month. You know what I mean? Let people get a revelation from God about how they need to deal with things. I, I didn't just stop, you know, a lot of y'all just stopped smoking. I didn't just stop smoking. I stopped smoking. Now, one thing I stopped right away was I stopped cussing. When I, you know, God called me in the ministry, I stopped cussing. I made a decision. I am not cussing. And I confess that scripture. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth about a million times. Every time I started to cuss, I had to, I had to say, I had to renew my mind, renew my mind, renew my mind. Right? I've been working on weight for all my life. I've been working on my weight but it's about to be over. I'm about to give it the last. I'm going to turn. This time when I hit it with the right hand, I'm going to turn everything into it. Amen? Hallelujah. Two, say 235. Well, let me just correct that. I'm going down to 235 or till all my numbers are perfect. I want perfect numbers. Amen? Hallelujah. And Jesus is the way. Amen? Luke chapter 16, verse 35. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. I want to read this in the Amplified. We're going to end right here today. We've got a couple more scriptures. Y'all okay? Luke chapter 6, it says, But love your enemies and be kind and do good. 
doing favors that someone derives benefit from and lend expecting and hoping for nothing in return. But consider nothing as a loss and despairing of no one. And then your recompense, your reward will be great. It will be rich. It will be strong. It will be intense and abundant. And you will be sons of the most high God for he is kind and charitable and good to the ungrateful and to the selfish and to the wicked. So you need to understand something. When you have, listen to me good, when you have repented and you have repented to that person, it's on them now. You've forgiven them. You have to stop harboring unforgiveness within yourself. You have to do what you believe God's saying to do and then you have to love yourself. You know, when the Bible says love the unlovable, God's actually talking to some of y'all to love yourself. Because some of you feel unlovable. Some of you feel unworthy. Some of you feel like you're not even worthy of God's love because of the evil and the bad and the treachery that you've done. But I am here to tell you that when you make that statement and when you feel that way, that is the pride of the enemy. Because there's nothing that you have done or nothing that you ever will do that is not greater than the blood of Jesus that he shed abroad for the forgiveness of all that you've done. Amen? You need to receive that. You need to receive that. Jesus not only gave forgiveness for those that are forgivable, he forgave those that are unforgivable. I want you to think about it in uh, 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 Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus says to the thieves on the cross, to the people that were sticking him in the side, to the people that were crucifying and killing him. Did any of y'all in here ever kill Jesus? I don't think so. Did any of y'all ever stick him with a sword while he was hanging? I don't think so. Did any of y'all ever even talk bad about him when he was on the cross? I don't think so. Yet Jesus on the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, they knew perfectly well what they were doing. I want to say, Jesus, you's a lie. Oh, they knew what they was doing. He didn't mean they didn't know what they were doing. He meant they didn't know what they were doing. So a lot of times when we do things that we do, we do them because we don't know what we're doing. It don't mean that we don't know what we're doing. We know when we get in the booth in the back in the corner in the dark. We walk to the booth. We walk through the dark. You don't just end up in the booth in the back in the corner in the dark. You walk there. You plan to go there. How many of y'all ever been, been, let me see how bad some of y'all are. How many of y'all ever been repenting while you're scheming to go do the sin? Any of y'all that bad? Yeah, that's how I was. I'm repenting while I'm going to do I know what I'm going to do. Father God, getting the money together, Tony. Forgive me. I'm going in my wife's purse. Lord, I'm sorry. I, I know not what I do. Be with me while I'm at this crap game, Lord. Amen? How many of y'all ever been there? Guess what? In the midst of that, his love is so great. His love is so great that he's already forgiven you. And you're going to let some debt that somebody feels you owe them. I used to tell my wife, man, it took my wife 15 years to forgive me. 15 years. You know when she finally got it, I used to tell her, you ain't got to forgive me, baby. I've already apologized to you and I and God has forgiven me, right? She used to get steaming mad when I would tell her that. Smoke, woo, would come out of her ears because she knows I did not give a hoot nanny. I'm telling you, some of y'all say that's me. I was, I'm trying to explain to you, if you cannot receive the forgiveness 
of God. And you don't understand. If, here's, and here was my argument to her. You mean to tell me you think I did this? We know what Ted Bundy did. He murdered women. God forgave him. Oh, yeah, go listen to his testimony. And then y'all tell me. You judge it. God forgave Paul, didn't he? Yeah. Paul murdered people. You mean Paul murdered Christians? Right? Yeah. Yeah. David was, I don't know if there's any more trifling than David. <laughs> oh boy, slept with the woman, got the woman pregnant, didn't kill. The, the man was a general in his army. You know, I, I, well, I'm not going to do all that. But, you know, I call, you know, I do something wrong to Alta. I call, call Leroy and I kill Leroy. So he, come on, man. And then God gets up here on Sunday and says, you know, Pastor Nick is a man after my own heart. And all of y'all see the film of me killing Leroy? Think about it. God literally said David was a man after his own heart. Why? Because he was repentant. He received. Listen, repentance don't just mean saying I'm sorry. Repentance means receiving God's forgiveness so you can walk in authority and the power that he's called you to walk in. The most vivid example I've ever heard of this was in a men's meeting. Maybe I shouldn't say this to y'all, but I am. Um, and I'll never forget the way Pastor taught, taught it. He used to tell us sin makes cowards out of men. Sin makes cowards out of men. And here's the greatest example. The man and the woman get in a fight. They have an argument. The man's anointed. The woman's anointed for the house. Anointed for those children. Anointed for that wife. There's an anointing on a man because he's the head. There's an anointing on all of us. To lay hands, the Bible says, on the sick and see the sick recover. They're upstairs, actually, they have a fight. The man leaves, gets in his car, Tony. Now he's mad at his wife, goes to his old spot, picks up a little something. Now he's going, right? Goes by, what's the strip club called here in Tampa's Mons Venus? What's it called? R Rachel's, right? Goes to Rachel's. Yeah, walks into Rachel's. Goes into the VIP room and does what they do in the VIP room. For those of you who don't know what goes on in the VIP room, in the VIP room you can pay, pay, a, pay a little bit more money and get sexual pleasure. Amen? Oh, don't look. It's real here, Jack. Gets in his car. Starts to come down off his high. Starts to realize what he did. Now guilt and condemnation come over him. He feels real bad. Man, look at this. What did I do? What a jerk I am. Feels terrible. Pulls up in his driveway. It's 4.30 in the morning. Opens up the front door. The little three-year-old comes to the top of the stairwell. The wife comes out. Honey, wait, she's yelling at him. Where have you been? The kid takes a misstep. Tumbles down the stairs. Laying right before the man. Neck broken, back broken. Kid just laying there. The man is anointed at that point, right there in that miss in that time, to lay hands on that child and see that child recover. See that child healed and whole because God has ordained him for that. But because of the sin of what he just did, because of the guilt of what he just did, he does not have the confidence to do what God has put the power in him to do because of what he did that, watch this, that Jesus and God don't even know about. They don't even know about his trip to Rachel's. Why? Because that's sin. What happens to sin in heaven? Where is Jesus seated? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, the Bible says, making intercession. You know what intercession is? You know what our intercessors do? Our intercessors stand in the gap for you when you can't stand for yourself. I tell you, a lot of stuff we did for, you know, we could talk, Tony could tell you about, oh, he called. I prayed a lot for them. They don't even know that. Interceding. Why? Because I know they're being attacked. I'm the corner man. 
They're in the battle. Sin will make cowards out of men. You not receiving God's love and you not receiving forgiveness from God will make a coward out of you. Jesus forgave and Jesus loved the unlovable. Some of you need to realize some of the people that you expect to love you, you expect to forgive you, that, that has not forgiven you, they are the unlovable. Stop looking for their forgiveness. Start loving them. Just love them. Just love them. But pastor, you don't understand how they treat me. You don't understand what they did. I don't need to understand anything. Just love them. Why? Because God loved you. Amen? Y'all get anything out of the word tonight? So the first two are, number one, Jesus was disciplined about the company that he kept. And number two, Jesus was disciplined in forgiving and loving the unlovable. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about Jesus uh, being disciplined and spending daily time studying the Word of God. We're going to look at how Jesus handled that. And then the discipline of being in prayer. We're going to go through all these disciplines uh, that Jesus had. And, and again, it's going to be a lot. And I'm going to say a lot of things during this, this part of the sermon series. But the key here is, is, again, listen to me. I don't want anybody beating themselves up. I don't want anybody be, we, look, we all miss it. We're all off. But the key is what we're trying to do now is we're trying to adjust our compass. And what we're doing right now is we're getting the settings. We're going to set our compass, right? We're going to set our mark. We're going to create our business plan exactly to the life of Jesus. It doesn't mean that tomorrow we're going to be on that plan. But that's what we're going to be focused on and we're going to be working to, amen? Now, that means we're going to have some victories and we're going to have some defeats. But in defeat, we what? Say, I will not quit. Therefore, I cannot be defeated. Give God a hand clap of praise. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you all for, uh, for just being here today. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Father, for every person at the sound of my voice, Lord. I thank you, Father, for them having ears to hear today. And Lord, I thank you today, Father, for Jesus being the God of, of forgiveness and the God of love, the God that loves the unlovable. I thank you, Lord, that as I'm even unlovable some days, God still loves me. And I thank you for that, Jesus. It's in your name that I pray, amen.